Hello, welcome to lecture number 10. We're going to do uh, the cerebral cortex today. Uh, we'll be talking about how we divide the corte uh, cortex up in a variety of ways. So one of the problems with cerebral cortex is uh, trying to figure out how to describe specific areas. And there are a number of different ways to do this. I tend to use sort of surface features, functional features, combination of surface features and directions. Things like the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is an important area we'll talk about. <clears throat> I do not tend to divide the cell, uh, the cortex up by cell architecture. We'll occasionally use some of the terms. So for example, the primary visual cortex is sometimes called the striate cortex. Um, but it's not generally how I prefer to approach the cortex, but other people may do so and you'll run across it a number of times throughout the text and in other areas. So it's important that we at least introduce the idea. So. Um, quick run through the surface features of the cortex. Um, pretty easy to navigate the cerebral cortex. The frontal lobe here is this large area in the front that is um, anterior to the central sulcus, which is this um, sulcus right here down the right middle of the brain, um, going in a coronal direction. Uh, directly um, posterior to that is the <sighs> parietal lobe, sorry. Um, and the parietal lobe has a number of uh, functions we'll get into later on. Then uh, the occipital lobe is tucked in here towards the back, just above the uh, cerebellum would be here at the bottom, uh, below the temporal lobe and the occipital lobe. Um, it's divided by the from the parietal lobe by the parieto occipital sulcus and uh, the preoccipital notch. Um, from divides it from the temporal lobe. And then the sylvan fissure, which runs along uh, the lateral side, is oftentimes called the lateral sulcal, sulcus, sorry, divides the frontal lobe and temporal lobes, and uh, the um, anterior sections of the uh, the parietal lobe. God, I can't talk this morning, sorry. Um, then when we get out in here to the um, posterior parts of the parietal and temporal lobes, you can see there's really no overall um, delineation. These are the same gyri that, that uh, run along. And we'll talk about these in a variety of instances. A couple ways to places we want to remember the central sulcus and the sylvan fissure. Sylvan fissure, sorry, or the lateral fissure are important um, sort of geographic marks that divide up uh, parts of the cortex. So that's an overall look at that. Uh, cytoarchitectonics uh, is this process by which the architecture is divided up by cellular structure. And um, this is something I don't generally uh, like to use because it doesn't map well to any system. So this is our Broadman's 52 areas. Um, and again, they're divided up by cell architecture, and these are determined by using a variety of stains, Nissi stains, Golgi stains, etc. You can read about them in the textbook. Um, but from an overall learning perspective, I just find that these numbers have absolutely no meaning. And they have absolutely, if you look at them, they make very little sense. Um, so uh, I just prefer not to bother with them. I know other people will uh, ask you to know them, and they become important. So you'll need to be able to look back at this map. Um, but just know, uh, from an exam perspective, I would never ask students to know uh, these numbers. but. Keep this handy in the event that you're reading and you want to uh, figure out what they're talking about. So uh, generally, as I said at the beginning, I use structural and functional combinations to describe brain, brain regions as we uh, introduce the primary visual cortex, what we call V1, is Broadman's area 17. It's also called the striate cortex. It's also called the calcarine cortex. Welcome to neuroscience. Um, everybody has to call something a little bit different. Um, I will use the primary visual cortex or V1 generally in that description. Uh, we'll then talk about the other visual cortex areas as we move through areas, MT, etc. cetera. Um, we will discuss cytoarchitecture architecture in some areas, uh, particularly we will look at the cortical layers and cortical columns. And so that will become very important, particularly when we're talking about vision. But overall, as we're navigating the brain, we'll be talking mostly uh, on a functional, structural functional combination. Quick note, some areas of the cortex don't neatly fit into um, any of these categories. So the cingulate 
anterior, particularly anterior cingulate, we're going to talk a lot about when we get to memory and in other cognitive functions. Um, this is also sometimes known as the mesocortex. This cost, it'll always be the cingulate. Um, it runs uh, right over the top of the uh, corpus callosum and then connects directly in with the rest of the limbic system. And in fact, oftentimes it's considered part of the limbic system. So that gets us into dividing up the cortex by function. So um, we sort of think about five general functional areas. Again, every Everybody does this a little differently. There's primary sensory areas. So the primary visual areas, there's the um, olfactory bulb, there's the auditory cortex, which is Heschel's gyrus. Um, there's the primary somatosensory area we've talked a little bit about already. Uh, there are the primary and secondary motor areas. Um, there are unimodal association areas. So for example, we'll talk about um, some areas involved in just, for example, vision and associating those with visual objects. Um, there are multimodal association areas. Uh, so, for example, your auditory and visual systems work together in a variety of areas. Uh, so when we start thinking about language, um, both your auditory and visual systems work together. Um, in particular, as you're watching somebody speak, if their mouth is saying something and they're, um, you're hearing something different, you'll oftentimes get a very different um, perceptual phenomenon known as the McGurk effect. And then finally, there are the paralympic and limbic areas, and these are really involved in uh, primarily memory and uh, learning. And so we'll get into those when we start talking later on. So another nice, colorful, overly annotated map. <laughs> but if we look in the uh, blue areas, these are the primary sensory areas. Um, yellow areas are unimodal sensory areas, or sorry, unimodal association areas. And then we have pink areas that are multimodal association areas. And then the green are the paralimbic association areas, or the paralimbic areas. Cingulate cortex, insula, orbital frontal region, parahippocampal gyrus, um, paraolfactory area, and the temporopolar cortex, etc. We're going to get into talking about these in more detail. So um, we're going to take those four lobes we introduced a moment ago and talk about these from a functional perspective. I've taken them in a particular order, but uh, we'll kind of make our way around the brain from the frontal lobe around back to the temporal lobes. So the frontal lobes contain the primary motor cortex. This is located in the precentral gyrus. Um, we'll talk a little bit about it before we talk about the prefrontal cortex. Um, so the frontal lobes also contain what are known as the supplementary and premotor areas. Uh, we'll get into this when we talk about action and motor planning, but we have primary motor cortex where um, motions are often sort of initiated from um, a muscular perspective. This, this is also coordinated through a variety of areas. The premotor and supplementary motor areas are involved in things like motor planning um, and sort of pre-setting uh, up uh, any sort of motion or action. The prefrontal cortex is an important part of the uh, of what makes humans very different from other species. We have the most developed prefrontal cortex. Uh, this controls many complex functions, just planning, controlling, and executing of behaviors. Um, and in fact, these are what we know as executive functions. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about this dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Lots of executive functionings occurring here. Unfortunately, this part of the brain is also susceptible to injury. So oftentimes when we talk about individuals with brain injury or brain damage uh, from a traumatic brain injury, it's this dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that seems to take the brunt of that damage. Uh, we'll talk also about the orbital frontal cortex, ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. Um, all of these have important uh, functions when it comes to things like working memory, planning and coordinating actions, planning for the future, etc. And we'll also talk about what happens when these um, systems are disrupted. So for example, we get uh, alterations in risk assessment, alterations in emotional processing, emotional control, etc. So we'll talk more about that uh, throughout the term. Uh, that gets us then to the parietal lobes. As I said, this is a fairly quick rundown of these areas. Uh, the first stop off in the parietal lobes, let me back up just a second, is the somatosensory cortex, which is just past the central sulcus. Uh, and what we call the post-central gyrus. Uh, so this is our primary somatosensory cortex. It's laid out right next to the motor cortex, and the motor cortex, uh, as you can see, sort of maps the somatosensory cortex, which makes sense if you're trying to coordinate information between these two systems. 
So it's laid out in this homunculus or map of the body. One of the most important things to understand about this particular structure is uh, the phenomenon of what we call cortical magnification. And what you can see is there is not a one-to-one -one mapping of sort of surface area of the skin to cortical processing. Uh, your arms, hands, shoulders, uh, head, neck, and trunk, relatively limited um, somatosensory representation. And in fact, there's a, there's a uh, perceptual task called the two-point threshold. We use what's called an anesthesiometer, which has two points on it. Uh, and you move them, uh, keep moving them apart until an individual can tell that there are two points versus one point. And what's interesting about this is it's pretty significant on your back, your upper arms, uh, your forearms, because we have such limited um, sensory processing. There's very little sensory information going uh, to and from the brain for those areas compared to face, lips, fingers, etc. It's the reason why a paper cut hurts much worse than a huge cut across your calf um, because there's just very little sensory information. Biting your tongue hurts really badly, um, whereas, you know, like I said, you can uh, end up with a cut on your leg somewhere and half the time not even know it's there if you're like me. And that's because of this limited sensory information. Uh, in the parietal lobes are also association areas. We're going to talk a lot about attentional networks. So, for example, there are um, a variety of... Um, Association areas involving shifting of our attention that involve both uh, auditory and visual information. We have uh, in the frontal lobe spatial working memory, uh, shifting attentions to locations, spatial relationships, a lot of work going on in uh, the parietal lobes and frontal lobes in these attentional networks. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about that. That gets us to the occipital lobe. Pretty easy to discuss. The only thing the occipital lobes do is vision. Uh, um, they have basically the occipital lobes contain the primary and secondary visual areas, and that's it. There's nothing else back there. Um, individuals who are congenitally blind, that is, they are blind from birth, who then learn Braille, uh, these parts will uh, oftentimes end up becoming somatosensory areas for your fingertips so that you can um, process Braille, and something we'll talk about when we get to plasticity. So as a quick look at the visual pathway, we'll spend some time here as well. We go from the retina to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. And then um, we go off to the calcarine fissure and uh, the extra strike, the striate cortex and the extra striate cortex, but that striate, excuse me, I'm about to sneeze. Um, striate cortex is that first stop, and we're gonna spend a pretty significant amount of time there. And that's what we call V1 or the primary visual area. Finally, temporal lobes. Um, we have the auditory cortex um, right here tucked inside uh, the basically it's inside the sylvan fissure. And here you can see what's called Heschel's gyrus, which is HG here. Uh, the belt area, parabelt areas, and the STG areas. These are often, uh, these are primarily involved in uh, auditory processing. You can see this is our auditory processing capacity, whereas this whole cortex here is devoted to visual processing. We are very visual creatures. We process most of our world through our visual systems. Medial temporal lobe complex. This will be uh, an area we spend a great deal of time with in uh, memory. In particular, we'll talk about patient HM and his loss of his medial temporal lobe complex, including his hippocampi. And so we talk about these as sort of one um, system. So this includes often the amygdala, the hippocampus, parorhinal cortex, anterorhinal cortex, and the parahippocampal cortex. All of these are important for understanding uh, memory functioning. Finally, we have some language areas uh, in the temporal lobe. So uh, we will talk about uh, Wernicke's area, which is where we process um, auditory information that translates, gets transferred then to Broca's area, which is where we start forming um, spoken language. So we process spoken language in Wernicke's area, and then we uh, begin to uh, process uh, our own spoken language in Broca's area, uh, which is a supplementary motor area. And we'll talk about that uh, as we move forward. All right, that's a quick introduction to the cortex. Uh, the next lecture you will uh, take a look at is uh, neural development, which is just a direct uh, take from my physiological psychology course. And then uh, we'll be moving on to research methods uh, next week.